Welcome, folks. We're going to get started in just a couple minutes here. Quick point of order, we apparently have exciting pillars. Um, so if you find yourself sitting somewhere where you can't see a screen, uh, probably move. If you want to watch Zach and I laugh and talk to each other and you cannot see our faces right now, probably move. We'll be in approximately these locations. And uh, if the obstructed view is causing a problem for you, now is the time to fix that. Also, I sort of imagine, since we're already sort of filling up, and um, this is a difficult to find location far away from where all the snacks were, more people will probably filter in. Uh, if you find yourself doing the traditional nerd thing of one empty seat between every person, if you feel the need to move a little in towards the sides, that might make it easier for people who come after you, particularly if you're sitting in the back. And if you're saying to yourself, but I need a lot of room, that is okay, but maybe right now, in the minute before we start, move a little further forward instead of being like right on the end of the back row, just because, you know. We want as many people to actually have a chair as possible. <coughs> oh yes, and if you're, if you're, if you're uh, used to me live tweeting conferences, Spoiler alert, I will not be tweeting this talk, so you all know what to do. You're not going to live tweet this one? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know. Do you want me to be in the talk with you, or <laughs> should I just sit down? That, that would work, too. Okay. I think we're, we're about at go time, so yes. let's, uh, let's do this thing. Um, basically, hi. Uh, we'll intro ourselves in a minute, but I'm just going to let you know right now, if you were not looking for Kubernetes, you are in the wrong place. Possibly at the wrong conference. Um, but yes, you probably, if you're interested in day two, if you want to have arguments about what day one versus day two means, we can do that at the booth later. But if you're interested in day two Kubernetes, you are in the right place. We're going we're gonna to talk about, awesome, you're actually running it. Now what? OK. Um, and uh, let's, let's intro our speakers real quick. I'm Bridget Kramhout. If I don't look familiar, but I sound familiar, you may have listed, listened to the Arrested DevOps podcast. Um, I live in Minneapolis. I work for Microsoft. And uh, I am the chief cook and bottle washer of the international conspiracy known as DevOps Days. The one in Seattle is going to be, I believe it's April 23rd and 24th. I think so. And uh, their CFP closes January 6th. So if you're very inspired by everything you're learning here at KubeCon and you want to propose a talk at DevOps Days in Seattle, or any other DevOps days, go to devopsdays.org and do that. And I'm Zach. I live in South Texas. I work for Microsoft as a cloud advocate. And I focus pretty heavily on DevOps and partner really closely with HashiCorp. And that's why you see the HashiCorp logo there. Um, and I also raise these cute little goats in South Texas. And I sing for several bands down there. So he, those are not a metaphor. Like, he literally has goats. They are. We got to find Michael Ducey and have a goats in the silo discussion. <laughs> All right. Uh, that's deep cut from old talks. All right, so let's let's start with the stage setting. Like, what even is, well, if you want to know what even is Kubernetes, you're definitely in the wrong talk. We're not going to explain that. But let's kind of scaffold to where we are and why we're talking about the stuff we're talking about. Starting with cloud. What is cloud? What is cloud? Um, well, uh, P there's the funny sticker about cloud being someone else's computer. Uh, I kind of like this XKCD. Um, I mean, what's, what's your take on it, Zach? I mean, it, it, shows, uh, it shows abstraction, but it's also hilarious. So um, yeah, it's nice. Yeah. And so what I, what I like about this is people sometimes tell you, they, you have a cloud in your data center, or we're using public cloud, or we're using hybrid cloud. And we work at a cloud provider, so you should definitely give all your money to the public cloud of your choice, hopefully ours. But the important thing there is you're picking the degree of abstraction that's right for the workloads and the workflow patterns that you're using. Which is to say, when somebody tells you that you're Kubernetesing wrong because you're not doing it with like, you know, a managed service in a public cloud, I mean, you know what? It's actually okay to get to your level of abstraction that's right for your organization's needs. Uh, okay, what about, what about containers? Uh, what is a container? Yeah, so um, our brilliant colleague, Jesse, Jesse Frizzell, a uh, few of you may know who she is. Uh, she puts it really well. She says containers are not a real thing. And, and in fact, they're process isolation based on kernel features. So C groups, namespaces, things that the process can see and the process can use. 
I, I'm pretty sure that if we announced an exciting C group startup, we would not get nearly as much funding <laughs> as uh, people do for container initiatives. So, um, okay. And for, finally, Kubernetes. Uh, I think the biggest shocker for me, especially if you're new to the Kubernetes space, is to look at this and think, wait a minute, 2014? Really? But yeah, the project's actually been around for a little while. Yeah, it's currently sailing. It hasn't fully sailed. That's my bad joke for the day. <laughs> and I think that the valuable thing there is if you are feeling like the tech FOMO and the, I'm already behind on Kubernetes, the data on the slide is giving me anxiety, don't worry about it because it's a work in progress and we're finally getting to the point where, you know, actual responsible adults would probably recommend to their professional colleagues, yes, we can in fact do this in production. Yes. So, hashtag probably fine. <laughs> okay, so I use this slide a lot and the main point that I try to make here is people get really excited about the shiniest new tech that they think will definitely make everything easier. Uh, that is not true, sorry, that is a lie. Uh, you know, yeah, I mean, th th these, are, these are tools that um, you want to use, right? You don't want to add more complexity than you need. There's no point in doing that. You're going to shuffle the complexity. You're not going to fix it. Right, like a, an old boss of mine, Tim Gross, who's at Instacart now, likes to call it conservation of complexity. Uh, you're going to have complexity, whether it's IPC or network latency. Like, you're going to have it. So if you're trying to decide if Kubernetes is right for you, we're going to go through a bunch of cool open source projects that kind of help with that, but if you're deciding whether or not it's right for you, it might not be, and that is okay. You do not have to Kubernetes everything. So I shouldn't take my monolith and turn it into a million microservices? Uh, you should, if that will solve problems you actually have, okay. like wanting to be able to do independent deployments at different times of those pieces. But yeah, okay, so what you all came for, uh, tools, yay, tools in the Kubernetes ecosystem. So there, there are a lot of tools here. You're, you have an entire three days of conference. There's no way we're gonna cover all of them in this session. So we're basically just cherry picking some. Yeah, for sure. And if you want to Kuber some netties, you are going to have to make a lot of decisions. Um, you're gonna have to figure out how you're gonna launch this, how you're going to maintain it, how are you going to build applications on top of it moving forward. Yeah. So I think the, the stuff that we're gonna cover, this is your spoiler alert slide, the stuff that we're gonna cover in terms of tools in this session, um, we're gonna cover getting started. I mean, you know, just Terraform. Yeah, we're gonna go over Terraform. Who here has used Terraform? Awesome. Yeah, That's I'd awesome. say about 50% of the room has used Terraform. We'll cover uh, some Helm and Draft as well. Who has used Helm and Draft? Awesome. All right, maybe 30%, okay. still pretty good. We'll talk about event-driven scripting a little bit, Bridget, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Brigade and Kashti, mm -hmm. um, and, and also uh, CNAB and Duffel. Oh yeah, how many of you watched the announcements out of DockerCon about uh, CNAB and Duffel? Maybe like six people. Excellent, there'll be new content here for a lot of you. A new acronym. Nice, because tech, as you all know, tech is severely lacking in acronyms, so we're attempting to fix that. <laughs> okay, so let's kick it off with a Terraform. What yes. is What even is Terraform, and Terraform how do we use it in this context? is awesome. <laughs> um, so Terraform, it, is, it allows you to basically um, uh, set up your infrastructure, basically across clouds if you want, across environments and it has this sense of providers that can basically speaking to APIs for you. Uh, the brilliant thing about it is that you are using the HashiCorp configuration language. You're not having to learn a new uh, way to speak to a different API. Basically. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things that really saves people a lot of time, right? And I think that's why a lot of you are probably using Terraform, is if you are multi-cloud, uh, sure, you write a whole bunch of cloud formation and you're like, that was great. And then you're like, oh, now I need to write ARM templates. That's even more. And it's nice to not have to, to have another layer of abstraction that saves you from having to do that. Right, yeah, and it makes it very simple. It's, it's Terraform plan, Terraform apply. That's, that's how you use it. Um, and also, I'll mention the module registry, the registry.terraform.io, and that's basically um, essentially packages of resources that are put together in a meaningful way. Think of it like a function with inputs and outputs. It's reusable code. Instead of pasting over and over all these resources, you can use modules. It's also a good way to get started if you haven't played with Terraform before. Oh, and one of the things we should talk about um, that, we, that we discussed that we were talking about is that it might surprise people if they're gonna use Terraform with Azure, say with AKS, uh, usually you think of Terraform as just something that you use to launch infrastructure, but what's the, but wait, surprise. <laughs> but wait, there's more. So uh, <laughs> Terraform can actually speak to anything with an API. So any of the providers you can use, if there is not a provider for something that you have, say it's proprietary, 
you can actually write your own provider, which is super awesome. But you can deploy straight to Kubernetes. So I can, and I'll show you in a second, you can deploy an AKS uh, cluster on Azure, and then you can deploy into that Kubernetes cluster using a Kubernetes provider in the same code base. Right, exactly. Um, so we've mentioned AKS a couple of times. Uh, as I mentioned before, we work for Microsoft. And so one thing that we like to show people is that of all the acronym soup out there, and there's, you know, there's your GKEs and your EKSs and whatnot, uh, AKS is the managed Kubernetes service um, from Azure. Yes, and it basically alleviates all the heavy lifting from you. You don't have to worry about anything except working with your Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, and uh, there's, there's a couple of um, things about this that, you know, again, like, we'll, we'll publish the slides later so you don't need to take pictures of every command and then try to type it in laboriously. But um, it's valuable to think about how, of course, you want to be able to instantiate clusters. Like, of course, you need to do that. Right. And um, this is actually just showing the AZ uh, CLI tool, just AZ AKS create, AZ AKS install CLI. If you don't already have kubectl installed, it will install it for you. AZ AKS get credentials will actually pull the credentials and set your context. Uh, for your Kubernetes cluster, and then you can use kubectl, and it's literally those commands. So if you've been to one of the uh, workshops where you do everything from, like, you know, Kelsey Hightower's Kubernetes the hard way, this is obviously faster. Yes. Um, also, I think one of the other things that we don't always think about is, cool, you stood up a Kubernetes cluster, that's awesome. If you're going to actually, you know, use it, you're going to need to upgrade it. And you might not want that to be a terrible disaster. Yeah, for sure. So there's tools like the, of course, you can list your clusters. It's pretty straightforward. But also AZ AKS upgrade, which will upgrade your cluster in place to the version that you specify. And a really cool thing, it looks like a harmless, simple command. And it, and it is a, a short command here to type. But it's doing some magic on the back. And it's following best practices. It will actually upgrade the control plane. It'll make sure that the nodes are then um, unschedulable and pulled out of rotation, basically. And then it will patch them in a rolling uh, update kind of pattern following best practices. Nice. OK, so Terraform, AKS, et cetera. Uh, should we do this? Let's, let's see this. Yes, let's see if I can do this. So this is just going to be a quick demo um, of Terraform. And you can see I have a, a, a Kate's demo environment that's empty right now. And what I'm going to do is show really quickly this is VS Code. That's just a very straightforward uh, Terraform environment. It's got a main.tf file where I'm setting the provider. I'm setting the back end for Terraform. I've also got a variables.tf file. I'm setting some variables that I'll be using. Um, you can see I'm setting a tag there as well. On the outputs, these are meaningful outputs for me. You can see that I actually set a kubeconfig output right there that I'll be using later. And I know this is going a little fast, so if there's anything I want to see later at the booth, just come and, and let me know. Um, and this uh, kates.tf file, this is actually setting an AKS cluster. It's everything that you need to set up the AKS cluster. And, um, the and yes, we pre-recorded this demo. He did it, but we pre-recorded it. Yes. Because <laughs> we're not going to make you sit there and watch while we type. And now you can see the provider Kubernetes right there that I just, it's kind of what I talked about earlier. This kates pod.tf is actually going to deploy an Nginx pod and an Nginx service. And it's just a, a sample. Uh, service, you can see uh, it's using Nginx 179, if I'm not mistaken, and port 80 uh, here as well. And so all I'm going to do, um, and this is VS Code, oh, actually, really quickly, this is a sample environment variable uh, file. And there are sensitive things that you do not want to store in your code base ever, like your client ID and client secret and subscription ID. So I actually export that, uh, and that's just an example of that file. Um, so here I am, I'm at the uh, terminal. I'm just going to run a Terraform version to make sure Terraform is installed and see the version output really quick. And a Terraform init will actually inspect all those Terraform files and look what, you know, pull what plugins I need, what providers I need. You can see that it created a .terraform folder. And a Terraform plan is going to actually do some cool stuff. Um, I don't know if I can get to that. Well, so a Terraform plan is basically inspecting all of those files, figuring out what the state is now and where the state wants to be, and it's figuring out a dependency graph on how to get there. The really cool thing about the plan is that it is going to uh, see what it can build in parallel, and it's also going to see what depends on, what resource depends on another resource, and it will do that all intelligently. And you can see I ran a Terraform apply, and now you can see in the control panel that things are starting to populate. My demo cluster is creating, and through the magic of video, this won't take the normal six-ish, seven-ish minutes, um, but it will finish. And you can see that I've got my Terraform output here in green. And you can see 
six were added, six resources. These are all the outputs that I configured. I know this is going a little fast, but um, what I'm gonna do is take this output that I've configured, the Terraform output kubeconfig, and basically I'm going to export my Kubernetes credentials, and I'm going to use kubectl, just the standard kubectl tooling to interact with this cluster right away. And now you can see I'm checking my cluster info to make sure I'm looking at the right cluster. I can do get pods. You can see my Nginx demo pod, get services, you can see that service. And I don't know why I didn't curl this IP, but I opened a browser and hit it, and there you can see the service running. Nice. And wait, do we have to, do we have, to have a throwdown about how we're gonna pronounce kubectl? I, I can go to kubectl <laughs> if you'd like. <laughs> okay. Okay, cool. Um, so that is an example of using Terraform with AKS in this specific case, but again, Terraform's open source and you can use it with your cloud provider of choice. Uh, but we also want to see a bunch more exciting open source. By the way, spoiler alert, the, the secret agenda to this um, particular session is to get you excited about and hopefully contributing to and using all of and maybe opening issues in all of these open source projects. Yes. Um, so starting with Helm, what in fact is Helm? Helm is a package manager for uh, Kubernetes and you can think of it like apt. And if you're at the keynote, actually Michelle uh, mentioned it earlier, but you can think of it like a, a package manager that where you can go and pull charts and actually install them into your cluster. And I think that one place where this is key is because we're all, we, none of us, when we're doing anything in production, again, we're talking about the day two realities of operability, uh, none of us have like one set of charts and one version of all the things and one cluster that it runs on our laptop. Like that, that's not reality, right? And so you wanna be able to keep track of all of the versions of everything that goes with everything else, this deployed, et cetera. Um, and in terms of what, oh, and uh, by the way, Helm was donated to the CNCF. Yes. So it is an incubating project, which is exciting. Um, that was, I forget, it was a couple months ago maybe. Yeah. All right, so let's, let's talk about the pieces of Helm. Just the, the quick overview is like, managing all the complex charts that I was talking about. Yeah, easy updating, simple sharing, and rollbacks. I have so many issues with that term, we'll talk about it. Um, okay, so I'd say starting at least with the, with the complexity, uh, we have an awful lot of YAML. When we talk to people about Kubernetes and we talk about Helm, I feel like we need to have a content warning for YAML. Like, I'm so sorry if YAML upsets you, but there's going to be lots of it. Um, and you wanna keep track of it all. Uh, and that, like, Helm and charts are a really good way to do that. Yeah, and there's um, in-place upgrades and custom hooks. So updates are super duper easy with Helm. Yeah, and I don't know about you all, but uh, it seems like people are wanting, to, uh, uh, wanting us to have fewer and fewer maintenance windows these days. Like, mm, just upgrade it. Upgrade the 747 while it's, you know, in flight. So it's nice to be able to do that in a controlled fashion. Who here loves maintenance windows? <laughs> Who here is still allowed to take maintenance windows? <laughs> yeah, no hands. Okay, uh, one hand maybe. Okay, and let's, let's talk about the sharing because that's kind of an exciting thing that isn't always built into your infrastructure tools. Yeah, so you can easily version and share these uh, charts with really anyone that you want to. Yeah, I, I think uh, sometimes when I'm doing a workshop, it's like, and we're gonna install Prometheus. We're not gonna take all the time to like read all the things and type all the things. We're just gonna use the Prometheus chart and hey, installation right on our Kubernetes cluster. Okay, so let's, let's talk about the possibly semi-controversial thing about rollbacks. Uh, rollbacks are a damn dirty lie because uh, and share can't turn back time and neither can you. So like what you can do is you can hopefully roll forward yes. you know, to, some, you know, to your old config in a controlled, you know, reproducible manner. Hopefully you didn't have any major schema migrations. Right, but it does give you that option. Yeah. We can do, can we do air quotes? Yeah, roll back. Okay, but uh, let's, let's take a look. Let's see some Helm. Yeah, let's take a look at Helm really quickly. So this is just gonna be another quick uh, demo here of Helm and you'll see, um, if I've started it, did I start it? Oh, there we go. Yeah, so you can see that I'm just doing a Witch Helm. And, I, and by the way, I've installed Helm and uh, draft in these demos using Homebrew. Uh, so I'm doing kubectl, config, current context, and cluster info just to make sure I'm working on the right, uh, the right cluster before I move forward. Helm init will install Helm into that cluster for me. And then I can do kubectl namespace, kube system, uh, get pods and get services. And what I'm looking for is tiller deploy. You can see it's a second line down there. I should have highlighted it 
but um, that's the tiller for Helm, which we can talk about later as well because of Helm version three. Uh, I'm doing a Helm repo update here to update the Helm repository, and I'm just gonna search for MySQL to install a, a simple Helm chart, and I picked Percona MySQL uh, because I've used it a ton in my past days at uh, Rackspace. And um, yeah, you can see it built here via that Helm chart it deployed, and it also spit out some notes for us as well that are helpful from this Helm chart. So I'm gonna do git pods, I can see that it's not ready, there's zero of one ready. Git services, you can see my dandy newt is already there, um, but it's, it's not ready yet. So I believe if I recall, yep, I git pods again, there it is, it's ready. And um, now that that's ready, I'm gonna use those helpful uh, notes and hints, and I'm gonna get my root password, which is super not safe, but I'm going to use this just for demo purposes. And I'm going to actually create a Percona client inside my cluster that I will use to connect to this new uh, Percona MySQL server, and you can see here I'm in the Percona client, just running simple MySQL dash H, uh, giving it a username and a password, connecting to MySQL, just showing the databases. Um, I'm really slow, look how slow I am, okay. And this is double time. This is double time. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I don't know, double time? I'm like, no, it'll be better, really. Yeah. So there you go, you can see uh, the MySQL databases. I log out, I'm gonna delete that Percona client. I don't need it anymore, goodbye. Percona client. And now um, I can actually use Helm to list that deployment, and I can use Helm to actually delete it from my Kubernetes cluster. So it's, it's full scope uh, management there. Nice. And you can see that it's gone now. Awesome. All right, so the, we've already now, we've looked at Helm, that's cool. Let's, let's talk about draft a little bit, because if people want to iterate quickly, like that, that inner loop of development, uh, it can seem like a lot of work to set up a whole chart and, you know, do you really want to sit there and learn everything about Helm and write Docker files? So enter draft. Yeah, you want that instant feedback, especially if you're building an application. You want to make a change and see that change quickly. Um, and draft helps you do that on container apps. Yeah, I think... Uh, Andrew Clay Schaefer, who is sitting in the front row, um, has been known to talk about developer dopamine. And it's like, it's true, true facts. True. Okay, so, um, and it's also, again, like, generate your Helm chart, generate your Docker file. Uh, you may or may not be using exactly what you generated in production, but this gets you going a little bit faster. Right. right. Should we look at it? Yeah, let's look at it really quickly. This is uh, just a draft demo. So it needs Helm, so I'm just doing a Helm version to make sure that it's there. Draft init will install draft for me, and draft version just to show uh, which version I'm on, make sure it's there. Kubectl, I'm, again, I'm checking my cluster because I always wanna double check which cluster I'm working with before I work with it. You can see I've got an app.py file and a requirements.txt. That's all I have. It is a straightforward uh, Flask app. Draft create detected that it's got Python, says it's ready to sail, drops me Docker files, drops me a draft.toml file. Um, and these are all sort of best practices or what draft thinks you might wanna, might wanna use. So you can go in and edit those if you want to. And from here, um, I've actually already configured ACR, uh, the container registry on Azure. And so draft up is building my container. It's deploying it, uh, pushing it to the registry and actually deploying it into my cluster. And what's really cool with draft, and we'll see it in just a second, um, now that it's there, I can do git pods. I can see my example Python app uh, right there. And I can do draft connect, and what that's doing is creating a proxy or a tunnel to where I can hit a local host port and actually get response from that container immediately. So say that I want to make a change to that and see that change quickly uh, reflected. Let's make a change. I'm gonna change that to hello kubecon. And once I do that, all I have to do is run draft up, and it's going to push those changes, push the changes to that container, redeploy it, I can do draft connect right away again after I see, you can see the old pod terminating, the new one running. Draft connect again, and then I'm gonna curl the new localhost port, and you can see that I have hello kubecon. And so draft will also allow you to, um, you can manage draft using draft delete as well, and I believe I show that here if I'm, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, draft delete will delete it for you. Nice, excellent. Okay, so Helm, draft. Uh, these, by the way, all have websites, helm.sh, draft.sh, et cetera. We'll have uh, links, I was about to say show notes, but not podcasting. We'll have links uh, in the, um, well, the last slide. 
Okay, let's let's talk about Brigade a little bit. Um, and we don't the, we're done with the demos now. So if you're like oh, demo heavy, or we're done with the demos now. But we're gonna just show you a couple more things. Uh, Brigade, I think, is when people are like, okay, Kubernetes is all about declarative configuration, and controllers are gonna just reconcile everything to desired state. And you're like, that's fine, but sometimes I actually need to trigger an event. Yeah, and that's what Brigade is for. It's it's uh, event driven. Uh, and you can you can basically write anything you want in a JavaScript runtime to uh, to to build that. Yeah. So if you're sick of writing YAML, you could write some JavaScript. <laughs> um, okay. And uh, I guess also whenever you're introducing tooling like this, I want to acknowledge there's other tooling in the ecosystem that bears some similar uh, similarity. Uh, definitely parallel evolution with GitHub Actions. Um, though those are only available for public repos right now. And so some people I think have already started putting open source out there about. Uh, is knitting them together with Brigade. So um, it's probably, this is again, this is one of those things that people find it really useful. And yeah. we use this ourselves, and uh, a lot of large organizations use it. It's yeah. just like super low key. We actually use, and I meant to mention that, we actually use Helm as well on, on, a, lot of our, uh, on a lot of our projects at Microsoft. I mean, yeah. we use our the own things that we contribute to because we love them. And we, and we use them because they're useful, not because they're shiny. Make sure you're using these things because they're useful and not adding complexity for you. Absolutely. Um, oh, and speaking of making things a little bit easier, uh, every time you have tooling and things go wrong, you want some visibility into what's going wrong. And Cache is simply a, uh, it's a dashboard for Brigade. Yeah. So it gives you that easy visibility, um, just like any dashboard. Ooh, ooh, visualize. does it also give us observability? Yeah. I wanted to give us all of the monitoring and observability t uh, buzzwords. Yes, so. all of the buzzwords. OK, cool. Um, also, there's uh, speaking of exciting and shiny, um, the exciting new shiny that we just announced last week, uh, the CNAB, because again, like I mentioned, tech doesn't have enough acronyms. Um, but the, the Cloud Native Application Bundle is this is solving a problem that you, know, you do have, even if you don't know you have it, which is, OK, you have all the YAML from you know, all of our Helm stuff. And you have your, your Docker files and your images and probably all of the backing service definitions that don't really go in any of those places. And you want to version those. And you want to tell if those are you know, reproducible yeah. and verifiable. And this is what CNAB does. Um, it's a, I mean, I'm just going to look at the notes to make sure that I don't skip anything I definitely want to talk about. I think that it's. Valuable in terms of uh, delivering an entire application, like the definition for an entire application. And um, this was actually, on, like I said, on stage at DockerCon. And uh, Matt Butcher and Gareth Rushgrove, who were announcing it, are actually both here at the conference. So you'll be able to talk to uh, you know, Butcher at the Microsoft booth. And presumably, Gareth will be at the Docker booth. And you know, you'll be able to discuss this with them in detail. I think Gareth is also speaking tomorrow morning. Yes, well. Gareth is, is tomorrow morning. He's definitely speaking tomorrow. So you can go look for his talk. Um, so anyway, if you're thinking, this is great. So there's a spec. Uh, what am I going to do with a spec? You can actually look at the reference implementation of the spec that we released called Duffel. Um, and so this is, again, like it's duffel.sh. Uh, it's all pretty new stuff, but it's all about packaging and also unpackaging your distributed apps. OK, what's next? So we have all these building blocks, and we can get repeatable, consistent deployments. But what, what does the future look like? Uh, I do feel like every time somebody gives you a mic, unless you stand on a stage, you should definitely progno prognosticate about the future. Um, so I think that winter is coming. And, and I'm not even really talking about snow, right? I mean, I guess it's. It's, I, it's getting real. I mean, your airlines, your banks, uh, they're if they're not already look using them, they're looking. Uh, your, your governments? Yeah. like. Basically, winter is here. Let, let's just be real about this. And I think that this is the, we are in this um, defining moment right now with Kubernetes where everything is about the production story. Like, you're actually trying to use it, which is why we have all of those open source tools. Because, like, it's very easy for people to tell you stories that live in metaphor. I mean, I can talk about the, um, the clouds, which are someone else's computer, and I can talk about how many units of DevOps you can put in the shipping container. I think it's about 20. Um, we can talk about 
uh, how we shouldn't have siloed organizations. We should have all of this tooling be used better to create cooperation across our organization. We have green fields, we have blue skies, we have this slow burning tire fire that is proud behind my Twitter handle. Like we can talk about things in all these abstractions, right? But I think that it's really important right now for us to get hands on, actually try this stuff uh, Jerome Petazzoni developed um, container.training. I encourage all of you to go and run through and try it. Yeah, if you work with technical experts, it's gonna smooth your, your journey as well. Yeah, absolutely. So like if you're, I would say, when you, go, when you go to use Kubernetes in production, you should strongly consider a managed service. And we work at a cloud, we would love it to be ours, but it doesn't have to be ours, but you, when you start building this stuff out, you'll see that you're gonna spend an awful lot of time on undifferentiated heavy lifting and incidental complexity that you don't actually need. Um, there's the, uh, James Waters from Pivotal likes to talk about the value line. And I think every organization out there has the things that are just overhead that they don't need to do and the things that, are, um, that add value. Uh, so I think that this is where it's really valuable to think about what makes a difference for you. Right. So, all right. And we had a little bit of talk in the keynote about Helm 3. And I wanna shift gears really quick and say, this slide's a little bit of an eye chart, but right now, the TLDR is right now, with Helm 3, we have a blog post and some stuff on GitHub, which means that if you have concerns, questions, comments, the desire to be involved, uh, you know, I use Helm 2 and I have many questions about what's happening with Tiller. Right, like, yeah, and so I mentioned that a little bit earlier, uh, kind of quickly, but Tiller, right now is installed in your cluster when you use Helm, but Helm 3 Tiller is going away. So shed a tear for Tiller. And <laughs> went um, for Tiller. <laughs> Helm 3 is moving to a more client side approach. Yeah, um, and then uh, if you've been looking at virtual kubelet, this was um, announced, it was worked on by a bunch of our colleagues and announced as just a new open source project uh, right before KubeCon this time last year. And it was you know, always meant to be kind of a, a reference implementation and now, Everything is very exciting. Like, if you take a look at, um, it's in preview now, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah, the, uh, and Brendan Burns just tweeted about this. I can blow his tweet up so you can see it a little bit better. Um, it is happening. Uh, the virtual nodes uh, are available um, in preview in AKS, and I think a lot of other providers are working on this too. This is basically um, bringing your chocolate and peanut butter together, bringing your serverless to your Kubernetes. So you can have all the buzzword compliant technology that you could possibly want. That's powerful. <laughs> it, it is. It's it is. And I think that it's when we, uh, our colleague Eric St. Martin, with uh, apologies to halt and catch fire, said that um, Kubernetes is not the thing. It, it's what gets us to the thing. Because if you think you're gonna go back to your organization and you're gonna say, excellent, we have now Kubernetes all the netties, we are done with technology, We've, we have you know, capstone project, we're done. Like, no, obviously not. Like, tech is gonna keep changing. And I think that it's really important for us to recall and to point out that it's not just the actual technology that's gonna keep changing. Yeah, I mean, there was a point when we were at dedicated hosting and then we thought, hey, we need VMs, let's move there. And now we're th thinking, hey, we've got all this overhead, let's move to some containerized applications. So, you know, hindsight, right? Uh, absolutely, and I think also, like, we're both standing here talking to you from Microsoft, which, if you haven't heard of it, is a little startup across the, um, you know, across some bridges from Seattle. Um, but yeah, I mean, seriously, though, the fact that Azure is more than 50% Linux I think tells us something about where the industry is going. Uh, I think it tells us something about how when you're in your organizations and you're having conversations with people who are like, well, we have the way we do things. Yeah, well, I mean, also, that's Jeffrey Snover, the creator of PowerShell, tweeting that. That's, I mean, that's pretty awesome. And, like, if you have, you know, if we have people who want to cling to the past, I would just point them to the fact that Jeffrey Snover is out there talking about uh, Azure being Linux, so yeah. maybe it's okay to change. And it's, there's not also a place where you're done changing, and now you've, you have deved all the ops, and you have continuously improved to the point of not needing to improve anymore. That doesn't exist either, right? Like Microsoft, uh, you know, 20 years ago, um, there were the Halloween documents. If you don't know what that is, check Wikipedia, or talk to your coworkers who are as old as us. Um, but we had an, a very anti-open source you know, environment, and turn around and... Yeah, Microsoft joined the Open Invention Network. And donated all our patents. 
So this, in fact, we, we just also donated Fippy. Fippy. Who, who's adorable. So like, I think that this is where the actionable takeaway there for you is you can say to your organization, we can do these new things because if they can, we can. Okay, so let's moment of ridiculousness when we realized we had essentially the same uh, pinned tweet. And it's, it's hilarious because we, we both are really excited about open source and that's why we're at Microsoft, which is amazing. So and one, of the, one of the things that I think is so amazing is what most of our sessions are about. Yeah, I mean, everything I talk about is, is Linux. And I honestly never thought I would be standing on a stage speaking, um, you know, working at Microsoft, talking, even Kubernetes. I mean, I, I don't know, it's a, it's a brave new world. It's, it's pretty exciting. Um, so we have a bunch of colleagues over the next couple of days. Uh, and you can find all of these on the website, but I, I wanted to maybe highlight just a couple of them. Um, like, if you are interested in um, admission controllers, Dave Strebel's session in the next, in the next uh, you know, time slot is gonna be pretty great. And, oh, Jessica Dean from our team is going to be doing some stuff about all the things we just talked about, but with Windows, because, hey, that is still a thing that exists in a lot of people's enterprises. So that's all today. Tomorrow we have, let's see, oh, there's so many good ones. Um, I would say, like, I will definitely be live tweeting, like, at least half of these, but you probably want to make it to them yourself, too. And then there's even more on Thursday. So, okay, so we're, we're about out of time, so should we just tell people where they can learn more about this stuff? Yeah, for sure. So if you haven't checked out the docs, go to docs.microsoft.com. Uh, you can go forward slash Azure slash Terraform here to get to the Terraform Hub, but the docs site overall is amazing. Like, we focus a ton on docs, and so, uh, check it out and let us know if you see anything you don't like, you know, we're here. Yeah, and there's a Azure free trial. There's also credits. I think they have a $50 credit at the Microsoft booth. Um, so you can go and get all your selfies with, you know, Fi uh, Fippy and win absolutely adorable. Ooh, we didn't even talk about the Magic Kate's Ball. Oh, yes. <laughs> Magic Kate's Ball. It will answer all your Kubernetes questions. You yeah, have you to see this. Go to the booth. Go to the yeah. booth. Um, and uh, all of those projects, we have people on site here who work on them, who can talk about them. Yeah. The Ignite tour is going on right now. Yes. So free training and uh, technology and talks in cities near you. And uh, yeah, what else? Yeah, you can get to the AKS docs there as well. It's uh, docs.microsoft.com slash Azure AKS. All right, uh, thank you so much. We're out of time. We will be happy to chat with you here and then over at the booth. All right, thanks. Thank you.